last week we talked about authentic prayer. Somebody say authentic prayer. We talked about how prayer, it's got to be the, the, the practice of prayer, the position of prayer, but then the passion of prayer. And what we're doing for the month of January is taking the Lord's Prayer and we're breaking it down phrase by phrase. Today I want to talk to you about dependent prayer. If last week we talked about authentic prayer, today I want to talk to you about dependent prayer. I think God takes great delight. I want you to hear this statement. I think God takes great delight when we declare our dependence on him. There's something, I think, that strikes a chord in the very nature of who God is. If he wants us to refer to him as a father, part of the father's joy is taking care of those who belong to him. And all the dads said, and if we feel that way as natural fathers, how much more does our heavenly father desire to take care of us? Matthew chapter 6, we said last week, Jesus instructed his disciples, he said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now pick up verse 10. He says, your kingdom come. Somebody say the kingdom. Now I want to stop right here and just, I want to look at that phrase. Your kingdom come. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, his kingdom is our priority. His kingdom is our priority priority. Jesus says, when you pray, pray our Father. Refer to him as Father. Last week we said 189 times in the Gospels, Jesus referred to God as Father. What a beautiful privilege you and I have to address the God of this universe as Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. There's a priority in prayer. For us, as sons and daughters, Prayer is not just building our lives, but it's prioritizing his kingdom. Can you help me this morning? His kingdom has to be our priority. Now, I know when we say the word kingdom, sometimes it can be ambiguous. What does the kingdom of God look like? What does it mean when we refer to the kingdom? And here's a definition. I want you to jot this down somewhere. The kingdom can be defined as this. Wherever the rule and reign of the king is. That's the kingdom. The presence of the king will determine the rule and reign of the kingdom. Okay, I want you to let that soak in mentally and spiritually just for a moment. Whenever the king shows up, whatever he decrees, the rule and the reign of the king is his kingdom. Now, in, in our country, sometimes it's difficult for us to connect mentally with that. And if we do word association, you know, for us as, as American citizens, for those of you uh, that were born and raised here in this country, our, our government is a democracy. And so we, we think about the rights and the privileges we have as Americans. We don't really recognize a king but we have a representative form of government. And so we, we go to the ballot box and we cast votes and we want the voice of the people to be heard. And in a democratic form of government, all the power is given to the people. That's the, the, the kind of the way that we think of things. But when it comes to the kingdom, it's a little different. The kingdom of God is different than the democracy of the United States. Can I have a better amen? So we got to shift gears a little bit because Jesus didn't come to take sides. He didn't come for Democrat or Republican. He's not donkey and he's not the elephant. He's the lamb. Come on, somebody. Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So when we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, we are recognizing I don't have a vote. When you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you recognize the rule and the reign of the king. If you've ever been on the mission field, you many of you know we've got a campus, and in fact, we bought a piece of property, and we're in the process of raising funds and building a building in Swaziland. You know, Swaziland is one of the few monarchs that are still remaining in the world. Swaziland has a king, and whatever the king decrees, if the king wakes up one day and says, you know what, I feel like today is a holiday. 
Guess what? The king has declared it, and so nobody's going to work that day. You mean, wait a second, you mean the king can just on a whim change the rules? Yes. That's how it works in the kingdom. Are you with me? Now, well, wait a second, wait a second. Sometimes it's hard for us to really understand. The king. Jesus said, when you pray, pray, Lord, your kingdom come. You know, we are taught to pray for the return of the Lord. We are taught to pray that the kingdom of God would come. Now, just in all honesty, because I grew up in church, and I heard this, that we're supposed to pray for the return of Jesus. Lord, let your kingdom come. And I really didn't want the kingdom of God to come until I got married. (laughs) How many of you, you kind of had some similar thoughts? Jesus, don't come back just yet. I want to get married. I want to fall in love. Come on, you watch enough Disney movies, and you're supposed to find that happy ever after, that Prince Charming, you know. Lord, Lord, don't come back yet because I want to get married. And then, you know, on your wedding day, I can remember thinking, Lord, don't blow that trumpet just yet. I'm about to say I do, and then, baby, it is on. Like white on rice, like cats on mice, like dots on dice, baby. We rolling. Lord, don't come back just yet. I want to get married. I don't want the the return of the kingdom just yet. And so we get married and we think, okay, well, Lord, I'm still not quite ready. Just give me kids. Come on, anybody? Lord, don't come back yet. I want to be able to raise children. And so God gives you kids. And then you're like, Lord, your kingdom come. (laughs) Right? Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come on. Jesus said, when you pray, pray that the kingdom of the Lord would return. Now, you know, we learn early on what it means to have a kingdom. I want you to consider this. We don't like when people tell us what to do, right? Some of this is a little threatening to our flesh. When we talk about the king and not having a vote and his rule and reign and his authority, and man, I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with that. Early on in life, we learn the meaning of kingdom. What is a two-year-old's favorite word? No! Either that or mine. What is that two-year-old beginning to discover? This is my kingdom. Don't trespass on my territory. Don't tell me what to do. This is mine. It's my world. It's my kingdom. I rule and reign. Now, me and my sisters, when we would go, when my parents would take us on long trips, we didn't have iPads, all right? We didn't have movies to watch. You got, how many moms or dads, you remember the day when you had to referee a wrestling match in the back seat of the car because your kids couldn't get along? I mean, between me and my sisters, we would have this little, and, and you know, I'm the middle child, so I have an older sister and a younger sister, so we always sat in order, and so I sat in the middle. We'd get in that car, locked in on a 10-hour trip, and I would say, hey, this is the line. <laughs> How many of you, your kids do the same? Do not cross that line. And what happens when the line gets crossed? It's war. And dad would be driving down the road threatening us. Kids, you better get on. How many of you ever threatened to pull the car over? I'm thinking, dad, there's no, you're not going to do that. You rolling 80 miles an hour. There's no way you want to stop right now. We're fight, fight, fighting and fussing in the back seat because we've, we've staked our claim. This is our kingdom. And then dad would bring back Mr. Claw. That arm would go into the back seat. And we would retreat to neutral corners. But dad had a way of bringing us back into play. He'd tap the brakes and we would lean forward. (laughs) Thy kingdom come. Somebody say kingdom. Jesus is talking to us about the kingdom, and he wants us to know there's something greater than your own agenda. It's called the agenda of the king. There's something, because we lack perspective. We lack understanding. This prayer is a dependent prayer. It's not just about building our lives, but it's prioritizing his kingdom. Now, Paul said in Romans 14, verse 17, here's what the kingdom of God looks like. It says, the kingdom of God is not in what we eat or what we drink, but I want you to consider the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody say righteousness. Say peace, say joy. 
What does the kingdom of God consist of? Those three things, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. How many of you could use a little bit more of that in your life? If you want righteousness, the ability to understand right from wrong and make right choices, how many of you think that's a good thing? If you want peace, the peace not that the world gives, but there's a peace that passes all understanding. That comes from the kingdom. If you want joy, it's not based on circumstances or what's happening around you, but joy in the Holy Spirit, guess what? That is the kingdom of God. So when we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, we're saying, God, you're the king, and wherever your presence is, the rule and reign of God, that is the kingdom. And I want righteousness in my life. I want peace, and I want joy in the Holy Spirit. In fact, I, I, I included this verse later. Uh, maybe, oh, they do have it. Okay, Luke 12, 32. Check this out. Jesus said, I want you to consider this. D don't be afraid. He's talking to us as believers. He's saying, children, my little flock, don't be afraid, for it gives your Father great happiness to do what? It pleases the Father to give you the kingdom. Well, hey, turn to your neighbor and say, that's good news. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit can be yours, and it pleases the Father to give this to you. Now, notice what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is he saying here? When we pray, we're praying, Lord, the things that are happening up in heaven. What's happening up in heaven right now? Jesus is being adored. He's being lifted up. He's being worshipped. There is joy unspeakable and full of glory. The command of, of heaven is through the authority of Jesus. He's now been raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father. Lord, what, what's happening up there? Lord, would you bring it here on earth? You see, prayer has the potential to bring a little bit of heaven down here to touch this earth. And you know what? This is a broken world. Man, this is a world full of hurt, full of pain, full of disappointment, selfishness, greed, materialism, evil, wickedness. But you and I have the power through prayer to bring a little bit of heaven. Lord, what's happening up there? Lord, let it touch earth right here. Somebody say the kingdom. Listen, I don't know what your agenda is, but I'm all about the kingdom. Let us be a church. I mean, think about it. When you're talking about praying a little piece of heaven down to earth, isn't that what church should feel like? When people walk through the doors of this house, shouldn't they sense peace, joy, righteousness. I pray that there's something different about the atmosphere because this church is about the kingdom. Can I have a better amen? This church is not about entertainment. It's not about a personality. It's not about bells and whistles. It's not about programs. This church is about the presence of the king. And if the king is here, then the rule and reign of the kingdom is among us. I think that if the church is about the kingdom, the world would be busting down the doors to get in. Give me some of that. But you know what the problem is? Sometimes the church is about its own kingdom. I want you to hear me. It's easy to preach the kingdom and then be all about your own kingdom. That's why for us as a, as a spiritual family, healing place, and we lock arms with other churches. And we celebrate what God is doing in other churches. Uh, the, 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 the world is bigger than just Healing Place Church. Now, we got a mission in the world, but we're not an entity in and of ourselves. There's this big C called the church. Little C, church, Healing Place Church, but big C, the church, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I want you to know it takes all different kinds of churches to reach all different kinds of people. So we celebrate different expressions of church. You will never hear anybody on this platform criticize another church. It may be different, but guess what? It takes all different kinds. Well, that church doesn't sing the hymns. 
Well, that church sings the hymns. Well, that church has too much lights. Well, that church has an electric guitar. Well, that church doesn't pray. Listen, you will never hear us criticize churches because we're not about egos. We're not about logos. We're about the kingdom. Come on, put your hands together if you believe that. You see, when you purpose to serve a power and authority greater than yourself, then you have the rule and reign of Jesus among you. Well, you say, well, Mike, what about when the king isn't present? What about when I go to work? What about when I go to school? What about in the community? What if what we see doesn't reflect the kingdom? Guess what? God has put you there. Watch this as an ambassador. Okay, now let's just think about this for a second. Boy, I, I, I'm having so much fun, we may not get to the other two points. But if you work in a dark place and you see depravity and evil and wickedness and immorality, don't criticize the darkness. Shine your light. That's why God has you on that job, at that school, on that campus, in that workplace, in that neighborhood, in that community, because if Jesus is in your heart, when you show up to work, the king has arrived. Now, now, now wait a second. Don't put your, you are not the king. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not the king. It's not your throne. No, no, no. When you show up, the king has arrived. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Jesus in you. Now watch this. You are simply an ambassador of the king. What does an ambassador do? Ambassador doesn't write his own policy. He is there on behalf of a power that is greater than himself. He doesn't get to speak his own opinions, but he's there to echo the command of the king. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost in here today. Jesus said, when you pray, pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Look at what it says here, the next phrase. Then he says, Lord, your will be done. Number one, his kingdom is our priority. Number two, his will is our desire. His will, the will of the Lord is what we desire. Now, now here's an important paradigm shift that I think we have to pay attention to. I want you to hear this. Because for many years in my Christianity, I think I got it wrong. I, I've always prayed, you know, my desires, Lord, the things that I want to do. Uh, you know, I'm a good guy. I'm trying to do good things. Lord, would you bless what I'm doing? And, and I think sometimes if we're not careful in prayer, we try to do our thing and then invoke the blessing of God on what we're doing. And God spoke to me several years ago. He said, Mike, you're praying the wrong way. Instead of praying, Lord, bless what I'm doing, he said, why don't you start doing what I'm blessing? Did you catch that? There's a shift now. There's a, not only are we prioritizing the kingdom, but we're saying, your will is my desire. I'm not doing all this stuff. Some of you are doing a bunch of busy work, and you're frustrated. And you're saying, God, why won't you bless what I'm doing? Why won't you bless what I'm doing? It's not fruitful. It's exhausting. And you're trying to pray the blessing of God over what you're doing when he never authorized you to do that. Maybe you're doing something that he never authorized. And so instead of praying, Lord, bless what I'm doing, why don't you start doing what God's blessing? Where is the blessing of God? Where is the favor of God? Where is the rule of the king? Let's do that. So I'm praying as a church, we're not starting all these programs. Hey, we need to, Healing Place needs to start doing X, Y, Z. No, no, no. We want to see where the favor of God is, and let's just get in flow with that favor. Let's get under the spout where the glory comes out. And if we'll stop praying, Lord, bless what I'm doing, and just start doing what God's blessing, then we'll see different results. Can I have a good amen? When we say, Lord, your will be done, don't do your own thing and then try to convince yourself that it's what God wants. You see, we're kind of like the guy who was on a diet, and he drove past Krispy Kreme donuts. And he said, Lord, I'll only stop if the light is on and if a parking space is available, 
clearly indicating that it's your will for me to be there. Well, you guessed it. Sure enough, after eight times around the block, the light came on. And after eight more times around the block, a parking space opened up. You see, I wonder if we do what we want and then we convince ourselves that God wants it too. You see, when you pray, okay, now this is, ooh, we're stepping into some stuff, right? Yeah. When we pray, worlds collide. Won't you see what happens? There's our thought, our understanding, and our desire, but then there's the thought of the king and his kingdom and his desire. And when those worlds collide, we've got choices to make. Are we going to pray, our will be done? Are we going to pray, Lord, I'm submitted to yours? You see, Jesus himself had to pray this prayer in one of the pivotal moments in all of Christianity. I think that our salvation, the tipping point of our salvation, of course it was the cross and the resurrection, but there was a significant battle leading up to that. It's called the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Jesus was in that garden, you could see his humanity and his deity, they wrestled. Those worlds collided. He said, God, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, let's explore those possibilities. Come on. Please, if there's any alternative, let's walk down the road and just try to figure it out. But nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. And do you see where victory was gained? In surrender. You see, it's not necessarily about strength. It's about surrender. How do you see the supernatural come about in your life? It's not what you accomplish, but it's in what you surrender so that God can accomplish through you. Come on, can I have a better amen today? Are you getting this today? Okay, let me put it in a natural analogy. Okay, since I'm kind of in that basketball mode and Trevor's game yesterday and they won by one point and my dad did the dance and was really inspiring. Um, let's just say you and Michael Jordan are on the same team. Okay, you and MJ, the greatest of all times. Now, I know LeBron's pretty good. All you LeBron kids, you know, your generation, go to YouTube and just check out Michael Jordan. Let's say you and MJ are on the same team, and you're in this contest. It's two on two, and, and Jordan is your, is your teammate. Can I give you a little advice? Don't shoot. <laughs> just a little friendly advice, trying to help you. Now, I know you may have game, and you may be played back in the day, and in your mind, you could do some things, but the best advice I could tell you is give Jordan the ball. Give him the ball. Get out of his way and let him dunk on your competition. I promise you will not lose. Oh, here's how you're going to lose. If you try to get in Jordan's way, if you try to shoot thinking you're going to win the game, it's not going to work out well for you. Can I tell you the best advice? Give him the ball and let him do what he does. You'll win. You see where I'm going with this? Some of you are a ball hog in life. You think you got game. You're trying to tell God. <laughs> I know we laugh at it. It's hilarious, but we do this, don't we? We're like, hey, we're praying. We're feeling the struggle of wills, these worlds colliding. And you're like, okay, God, time out. Come here, come here, come here. <laughs> You see, you really don't know. If I, let me tell you how she is at work, and that's why you're going to understand better the, what I'm saying now. What, and God's like, listen, I already know. If you'll give me the ball, I can dunk on your competition. It's a slam dunk. I'm telling you, you're going to win this thing if you surrender your will to the Lord's. Somebody say, your kingdom come. Say, your will be done. Now, now this, is a, this is a real challenging thing for us because we're very independent in the way that we think and the way that we live and our decisions. But if we will include God in everything we do, that thing that you're wrestling with right now, I don't know what it is. I don't know who it is. But if you'll invite God and give him the ball, let him do for you what you could never do in a thousand years. 
In fact, I want you to do this. I want you to put your pens down, your papers down, your Bibles down, your, your notepads, and I want you to put your hands out in front of you, and I want you to make a closed fist like this. Okay, and I want you to clench it. Now, the mentality of the world, and I think we've done this before, but I think it's good to revisit when we talk about surrendering our will to God. The mentality of the world is get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can so nobody gets what you got, right? And we're going to go through life, we're going to take the bull by the horns, we're going to decide. We're, man, it, we're going to reach out and do the, the power and the strength of our hand. We're going to do it. And, you know, maybe you hold on to the things that you have if you live life like this. But the challenge is God can't put anything into these hands. If you're living life like this, God has no room to give you what you need. Now, I want you to release open the palms of your hands, and I want you to, ex like, if, we, if we extend our hands toward heaven like this, now we're not holding on to our stuff and our own understanding, making our, it's not my will, but Lord, your will be done. This requires you to let go. Come on, somebody say, let go. Let go. Say, let God. God. You see, when you release what's in your hands, guess what God does? He releases what's in his hands. Now we've got space for God to put something in here that we desperately need. Can I have a better amen? Don't live life like this. If you'll live open-handed, then you can be led by a good, gracious Father who will give you exactly what you need. Do you believe that? Martin Luther said this. He said, I've held many things in my hand, and I've lost them all. But whatever I've placed in God's hand, that I still possess. Whatever you place in God's hand, I'm telling you, you want security? Put it in the hands of God. All you parents, don't worry about your kids. Put them in the hands of a sovereign God. And whatever you place in his hand, that you will still possess. Somebody say, your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Let me finish right here, and I want to ask the band to come up. Number one, we said his kingdom is our priority. Number two, we say his will is our desire. But finally, where I want to land today, number three, his provision is our source. His provision is our source. And I thought it was important to cross the finish line of the message on this point for this reason. Notice the order of the prayer. What did we pray first? We prayed his kingdom and we prayed his will. Once you prioritize his kingdom and you surrender to his will, now watch this. You can ask God for whatever you need. He says, give us. Notice you don't start the prayer with give us. Can I say that again? We don't start the prayer saying, give me. We start this prayer saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, I'm prioritizing your kingdom. And God, I'm surrendered to your will. When worlds collide, Father, I want your desire even greater than my own. I surrender. Then that's the position where you say, give me. Give me this day what? My daily bread. What is bread? Bread is the very basic of human necessity. We're not praying for luxury. We're saying, God, will you supply necessity? There's a wonderful guarantee in this prayer. When you prioritize the kingdom and surrender your will, everything that you need, God will supply. And here's why I wanted to end it this way, because I'm, I'm reading your prayer request cards. Thousands have been turned in, and we've been praying for them all week. And do you know, probably 75% of those prayer cards include financial breakthrough. God, I need you to touch my finances. Lord, I need a job.
God, I need a pay raise. I, I'm, I'm trying to raise these kids. A single mom said, I'm working two and three jobs. I need a bonus. I need a promotion. Some of you have been struggling financially. And you know what happens when you struggle financially? There's a lot of fear attached to that. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? Maybe you're in a season right now where things are lean for you financially. And the, the temptation is to worry about what you don't have. You see, the devil wants you to worry. Worry is a sign that you've forgotten God is in the room. Mm. You Worry, think about it now. We have forgotten God is with us. Wait a second. If I'm prioritizing his kingdom and I'm surrendered to his will, then everything that I need, Mike, you mean everything? I mean absolutely everything. You know, I was reading in Genesis where God spoke to Abraham. He said, Abraham, Genesis 22, take your son, your only son, this son of promise, and I want you to go up to the place that I'll show you on that mountain, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice to me. I read that again this week, and I wrote in the margins of my Bible, God, I don't think I can do it. I couldn't do it to offer your son as a sacrifice to God. And I read the story again with just this, this, this dread, this anxiety. And I came across verse 5 where Abraham said to his servants, he said, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there. Then we will come right back. Notice what Abraham did. When he went up that mountain, why don't you check this out? He went up with faith. You see, God was testing Abraham. How did Abraham respond? Verse 5 says, worship. What are you going to do? We're going to worship God. We're not going to worry. We're going to worship. And he says, we're going up to that mountain and we're going to worship. And guess what? We will return again. And you know the story. They've got the fire. They've got the wood. They've got all the supplies. Isaac said, wait a second, where's the, where's the sacrifice? Abraham laid him on the altar, tied him up, bound him up. He raised the knife. God said, Abraham, Abraham. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. I know that you fear me. What's he saying? I know that you trust me. I know that you're obeying me. Do no harm to your son. There's a ram that's caught in the thicket. Listen, when Abraham was walking up one side of the mountain, little did he know that his solution was coming up the other side. I want you to know, whatever it is that you have need of, God said, you don't see it now, but if you'll climb the mountain in obedience, you will be met by my faithfulness. I will supply everything that you need. What did Abraham name that place? He said, this place will be called Jehovah. Jireh. What does that mean? It means God will provide. I'm declaring to you this year, I don't know what you need, but the God you serve will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is not just barely get by, but he is more than enough. I'll give you whatever it takes, whatever you need, God says. Give us this day our daily bread. God has bread for you today. God has bread for you today. God has bread, and he wants to give it to you today. 